Hey guys, Colin here, and welcome back to the channel where we bring you Christian commentary about the things that matter. As ever, please know this video isn't a sinful attack, but rather a biblical critique. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the Gospel Coalition's response to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. This was a landmark decision, and it is an excellent step in the right direction for Christians and the worldview we subscribe to. This is, of course, something that God ought to be praised for. He did not have to providentially bless us with this ruling, and that is all the more reason to thank Him. As James 1.17 says, quote, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So let us thank the Lord wholeheartedly for this gift and not take it for granted. More innocent unborn babies will be saved from death, and that is definitely a great gift from God. So with that said, let's turn and see what the Gospel Coalition had to say about this ruling. They have a recent article entitled, quote, after Roe, Choose Compassion Over Culture War, written by James Forsyth. Right out of the gate, we need to recognize that there is a false dichotomy of sorts at play here. The implication is that those who want to fight in the culture war cannot do so with compassion. This claim is unfounded and untrue. Of course, it is entirely possible that someone could fight in the culture war with a lack of compassion. We all know that. We've seen that. Yet, this again does not prove that fighting the culture war is inherently an uncompassionate thing to do. But more on that in a moment. In the article, James says this, quote, But as we welcome this ruling, we must be measured in our response. Now is not the time for the church to beat its chest in celebration of a victory in the culture war, end quote. Now, just to be clear, there is no real definitive example of what this unbiblical celebration of the decision would even look like. Therefore, the reader is left to their own imagination on this issue. In fact, many people who read this article will be left with the distinct impression that any passionate celebration of any kind about this decision would be unchristlike. Indeed, any use of the word celebration in the article itself gives the word a negative connotation. That's very clear. There is, however, another article linked by the author which encourages celebration of the Dobbs decision. That must be noted. The author's position on celebrating this ruling is, at best, confusing and contradictory, and at worst, just plain bad advice. The closest the author ever specifically comes to celebrating the overturning of Roe is when he says this, quote, Christians on both sides of the aisle should welcome this ruling, end quote. This seems to be a tremendous understatement and far from any kind of celebration. I suppose Christians should have calmly welcomed the end of the Holocaust, right? Should Christians have tamely welcomed the end of slavery? Should Christians have simply welcomed the freedom to serve their God without imminent fear of death and persecution? Somehow, I don't think the response to those issues would be exactly the same as the response to this one. At least, that is certainly the case in most big Eva churches and in publications like the Gospel Coalition. But why is there a different response? Thousands of innocent unborn baby lives will be saved by this ruling. If that is not something we can wholeheartedly celebrate in public passionately as a church, I'm not sure what is. This kind of response, then, illustrates how much Big Eva types have submitted to the secular culture. Romans 12.2 says this, quote, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, end quote. What Christians should and should not celebrate, and to what degree they ought to celebrate it, is not dictated to them by the emotional response of the secular world. It is given to us by God's word. The culture wants to literally kill babies. That's their standard. They want to murder actual children. And when we partially remove their right to kill babies and celebrate the removal of such a wicked so-called right, we are often chastised by mainstream evangelical leaders and given vague commands to be more compassionate and stay out of the culture war. That's not for you, Christian. This is absurd. Here's an example of why. We will publicly celebrate the birth of a child. Indeed, this birth is so joyous that we commemorate its anniversary every year. It's called a birthday party. How absurd is it to say that we can publicly and passionately celebrate the birth of our children in our churches, houses, and even public restaurants? But we must be reserved and calm and tame when it comes to the matter of, oh, I don't know, saving the lives of thousands of other babies. If you believe that the joyous, public, and passionate celebrating of the overturning of Roe was wrong, then tell us by what standard it is wrong, and where specifically it becomes wrong. 
This article fails to do anything of the sort. Instead, it merely gives us vague and ambiguous references to Jesus' love and compassion. The problem with this is that you may be encouraging people to stop celebrating something that they really ought to be celebrating. And let's also talk about the tone of these celebrations, which draws a lot of criticism. Jesus himself says in Matthew 18, 6, quote, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea, end quote. If Jesus said something this harsh about those who cause the little ones to sin, what do you think he would have said about those who lobby for the right to kill these little ones before they're even born? It's strange to me that anyone could read this passage and then chastise conservative Christians for posting a mild Instagram story celebrating the Supreme Court's ruling. Most of the arguments against the tone of those conservative Christians celebrating the decision are entirely subjective and really unhelpful. So we ought to celebrate Roe's overturning because we love children. Of course we should, and we should celebrate their right to life. Unless your rejoicing leads you to sin against someone, you may do it all you want, and I would encourage you to do it. We should not allow our celebration of children being alive to be superseded and dampened down by the sadness and disappointment felt by those who want the children dead. That would be utterly backwards. But this seems to be what the TGC article is advocating for. And the article continues, saying, quote, As access to baby killing, my words, not his, becomes more limited, an untold number of women, sometimes supported by partners but typically alone, will find themselves in crisis, in shock, fear, and despair. They are now without the only option that seemed to offer hope. The celebratory fanfare of a political culture warrior may make judgmental Christians feel better about themselves, but it does little to help these women." End quote. And pay attention, because this is the crux of the argument here. You shouldn't celebrate the overturning of an evil and murderous law, because many women wish that law still existed, and that law not existing doesn't allow them to murder their children, which makes them pretty upset. Again, which part of that argument is biblical? Let's use another analogy, shall we? Suppose someone wanted to steal the purse of an old lady, which, by the way, is a significantly less severe crime than killing an unborn child. But suppose this is the case. Let's say a thief wants to steal the purse of a little old granny. In fact, suppose the Supreme Court had made a ruling decades ago that allowed for any man to steal the purse of any elderly woman at any time. In fact, to be precise, let's say that over 61 million of these women had their purses stolen since the law took effect. Their belongings were taken, their identities were stolen, and their lives were made infinitely more difficult and unsafe than they already were. And then, finally, one day, the law was overturned, and these women were freed from this evil being perpetrated against them. Would this not be something that the church should celebrate publicly and passionately? Of course we should, and the people at the Gospel Coalition would celebrate it, I'm sure. But there's one group of people you're forgetting about. What about the thieves? They really counted on the money that they stole from these old ladies. They used it to pay their expenses. Now, without the ability to steal women's purses, surely they're going to be very upset and disadvantaged. And after all, you've just taken away their right to steal. A right that they've had for years. That's very hard for them, isn't it? Many of them have had hard lives which led them to even want to steal in the first place. And you have the audacity to celebrate this ruling like it's some sort of victory? You're doing a victory lap? You're hitting your chest in celebration? That may please your judgmental conscience, but it doesn't do anything to help these thieves who wanted to steal. This may feel like a victory for you, but for them, it's a nightmare. They've lost their income, and they don't know what to do now. So surely you see the analogy here. It's absurd for us as Christians to let our sympathy for these thieves increase to the point that we stop celebrating that these women they wanted to steal from are protected under the law. We should want that. And again, let's remember that stealing someone's purse is significantly less severe, ethically speaking, compared to killing your own baby. You see, we can sympathize with women who want to kill their baby, but we will not sympathize with them because they're sad that they can't kill their baby. That's the issue here. We will not sympathize with any laments that come as a direct result of them losing their right to kill their baby. Perhaps they have been abused. That would be horrible. 
Perhaps they've been trafficked. That's horrible too. Perhaps they're just a slave to their own sin. And we ought to sympathize with them there as well, knowing full well that Christ came to free us from our own slavery to sin. As Galatians 5.1 says, quote, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. End quote. You see, there are many ways that we can and should sympathize with these women as fellow fallen sinners. We're no better than they are. There are many ways, both spiritually and physically, that we should try to help them. I agree with that. But what if these women are sad, upset, disappointed, because they really wanted to murder their children, and now they can't? What if they're sad that they've lost the, quote, only option they had left, that option being, of course, murder? Should we sympathize with them on that, too? Absolutely not. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says this, quote, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, end quote. This illustrates the absurdity of sympathizing with a woman's desire to execute her baby in the womb, or the sadness she feels because she can't do that. It's a satanic idea. When a Christian brings sympathy to the table with regard to this feeling or this particular point, they're effectively saying this, I'm so sorry about the fact that you and Satan can't break God's law and sacrifice children. I'm so sorry that you're sad as a result of you being told you can't murder a kid. This kind of response, though it may appear loving at first, is nothing short of demonic. If we're on Jesus' team, then we must celebrate abundant life, the kind of life he came to give, and especially life with him. Yet, by the very same standard, we must also rebuke the unjust taking of life and never sympathize with, in any way, the desire to steal, kill, and destroy. In short, the Gospel Coalition is way off on this issue, as you might have expected. Not in every respect, but in many ways. And it only illustrates even further why they are not a reliable source when it comes to politically charged social controversies. The culture war, my friends, is all around you. You can either fight the war biblically with truth and love, or you can be utterly ineffective. The choice is yours. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and please know this, I do not offer any of this correction from a high and mighty position. I am nothing but a wretched sinner saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for the Gospel Coalition, that they would move in a much more biblical direction instead of where they're going, and by God's grace, that they would turn to the truth of God's Word. Thank you so much for watching that video. Please give us a like and subscribe so that you don't miss any content. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our Rumble channel as well, just in case YouTube ever takes us down. The link is in the description. And before you go, take a look at this list here. These are the people who make all of the free content you see on this channel possible with their monthly support. Today's highlighted channel supporter is Greg H. If you also want to help and become part of the solution today, hit the link in the description. Your support keeps us independent and helps us immensely here on the channel. So I hope you'll consider joining the Truth Army today, and until next time, fight for truth, never surrender, and keep your eyes open. Thank you, and God bless.